Welcome back. In this video, we'll talk about a very important topic known as volumes and snapshots. This topic is extremely important, not just from the examination standpoint, but also from a knowledge standpoint. If you're going to be building your career on AWS, or if you're going to be working with AWS frequently, it is important to know volumes and snapshots very well. Let's begin. All right, let's start by talking about the different storage options available on AWS. Number one, we have Amazon EBS, also known as Elastic Block Store. EBS provides durable block level storage volumes that we can attach to a running instance. When I say running instance, it of course means a running EC2 instance. We can use Amazon EBS as a primary storage device for data that requires frequent and granular updates. So think of an EBS volume as a hard disk that we attach to a physical computer. In a similar way, EBS volumes are virtual disks or virtual volumes that we attach to EC2 instances. Next we have Amazon EC2 Instance Store. Instance Store provides temporary block level storage for instances. The data on an Instance Store volume persists only during the life of the associated instance. If you stop or terminate an instance, any data on Instance Store volumes is lost. So primarily, the difference between EBS volumes and Instance Store volumes is the persistence of data. Even if your EC2 instance is terminated, your data can still stay on the EBS volumes. However, with Instance Store, that is not the case. If your EC2 instance is terminated, the data on your Instance Store volume is also lost. Next, we have something called Amazon EFS or Elastic File System. EFS provides scalable file storage for use with EC2. You can create an EFS file system and configure your instances to mount the file system. We can use an EFS file system as a common data source for workloads and applications running on multiple instances. So when we talk about EBS volumes, you can only have one volume attached to one instance. The same volume cannot be attached to multiple instances. If we need that kind of a storage, where one storage device is actually attached to multiple EC2 instances, we'd actually go with EFS or Elastic File System. We can create an EFS file system and attach it to multiple running EC2 instances. Think of it like a file server. Next we have Amazon S3. Amazon S3 provides reliable and inexpensive data storage infrastructure enabling you to store and retrieve any amount of data at any time from within Amazon EC2 or anywhere on the web. Amazon S3 is a major discussion and we're going to have dedicated videos where we'll talk about Amazon S3. Think of it as object-based storage. You can put your files, your photos, your videos, your songs and all of that. So what's the difference between Amazon S3 and Amazon EBS? Well, EBS is block-based storage. You can install operating systems, databases and so on while S3 is object-based storage. You only put flat objects like photos and videos and so on. Now let's talk about EBS volumes in detail. In this video, we are only going to understand EBS volumes from a theoretical standpoint. In the next video, we'll have a lab on volumes and snapshots. Elastic Block Store, also known as EBS, provides block-level storage volumes for use with EC2 instances. EBS volumes are highly available and reliable storage volumes that can be attached to any running instance that is in the same availability zone. This is a very important factor. If your EC2 instance is running in AP South 1A, which is availability zone number one in Mumbai, your EBS volume also has to be in AP South 1A. EBS volumes can persist independently from the life of the EC2 instance and you only pay for what you use. Like we understood earlier, even if your EC2 instance has been terminated, you can still retain your EBS volumes. EBS volumes are well suited for use as the primary storage for file systems, databases or for any applications that require fine granular updates 
and access to raw, unformatted block level storage. Like I said earlier, think of an EBS volume like a hard disk on your physical computer. EBS volumes can also be created as encrypted volumes. When we create an encrypted EBS volume and attach it to a supported instance type, data stored at rest on the volume along with disk IO and snapshots created from the volume are all encrypted. EBS volumes are flexible. You can dynamically grow volumes, modify the provisioned IOPS capacity and change volume types on live production volumes. If you've not heard about IOPS, it stands for input output per second. So EBS volumes are really flexible. Even when your EC2 instance is actually running, you can change the size of the volume, you can modify the provision IOPS, and you can also change the volume type. We are going to see all of this in the lab that is coming up in the next video. Now let's talk about EBS volume types. There are five types of EBS volumes that we can create. The first one is general purpose. The second one is provisioned IOPS. The third one is throughput optimized. The fourth one is cold HDD. And the fifth one is magnetic. You see some letters in the parenthesis, right? So that is the symbolic representation of each of these EBS volume types. If we have to create EBS volumes from the API calls, then we'll have to provide these symbolic representations. To understand the differences between all of these, I'm going to take you to Amazon's documentation. Alright, so I'm on this page called Amazon EBS Volume Types. I'm going to give you a quick tip to prepare for the exam. One very important activity that you'll have to do when you prepare for your exam is to prepare your notes. Your notes will serve as a quick last minute revision. And to prepare your notes, I'm going to strongly recommend to use the Amazon documentation as the source of all information. AWS keeps adding new features and new products and the best way to stay updated with the latest information is Amazon's documentation. Right? So let's look at the volume types. Down over here we have two main types of volumes. You have solid state drives called SSD and you have hard disk drives called HDD. General purpose and provision IOPS are types of SSD while throughput optimized and cold HDD are types of HDD. Each of these volumes has a specific use case and specific performance levels. For example, when we talk about general purpose SSD, you can see the use cases over here. It is recommended for most workloads like system boot volumes, virtual desktops, low latency interactive apps, and so on. While provisioned IOPS is suitable for use cases like critical business applications that require sustained IOPS performance, large database workloads like MongoDB, Cassandra, and so on. Technically, there are some differences as well. For example, with general purpose, the volume size can be between 1 gig, between 1 gig and 16 TB, while provision IOPS can be between 4 GB and 16 TB. The IOPS also varies. General purpose gives you about 10,000 IOPS per volume, while provision IOPS can give you up to 20,000 IOPS per volume. Similarly, we have um, throughput optimized, which is suitable for streaming workloads requiring consistent, fast throughput at a lower price, such as big data, data warehouses, and so on. While cold HDD is suited for throughput oriented storage for large volumes and so on. And then both of these volumes have their own um, technical values. For example, the volume size can be between 500 GB and 16 TB. And then um, you have the throughput value and um, the IOPS values over here. One thing that we need to remember is for SSD backed volumes like general purpose and provision IOPS, the main performance metric is IOPS or input output per second. While for HDD backed volumes like throughput optimized and cold HDD, the performance metric is throughput, not IOPS. Right? So this is the column which is important for HDD backed volumes and this is the column which is important for SSD backed volumes. The last one is magnetic. Now Amazon calls it now as previous generation volumes. 
right? It's called as EBS magnetic. It is suitable for workloads where data is infrequently accessed. The volume size is between 1 GB and 1 TB. And you have some other performance metrics as well. For more information, I'm going to leave a link to this page in the description section. All right, back over here, let's talk about data availability on EBS volumes. When you create an EBS volume in an availability zone, it is automatically replicated within that zone to prevent data loss due to failure of any single hardware component. Which means when we actually create a volume, AWS takes care of replicating that within the same availability zone so that we don't have data loss. After you create a volume, you can attach it to any EC2 instance in the same availability zone. An EBS volume can be attached to only one instance at a time within the same availability zone. However, multiple volumes can be attached to a single instance. And I'm going to show you this in the next video when we do a lab. If you attach multiple volumes to a device that you have named, you can stripe the data across volumes for increased I.O. and throughput performance. Let's talk about data encryption on EBS volumes. All EBS volume types support encryption. Amazon EBS uses 256-bit advanced encryption standard algorithms, also known as AES-256, and an Amazon managed key infrastructure. The encryption occurs on the server on which the EC2 instance is actually hosted, providing encryption of data in transit from the EC2 instance to the EBS storage. The first time we create an encrypted EBS volume in a region, a default master key is created for you automatically, and this key is used for Amazon EBS encryption. If we want to create encrypted EBS volumes, we don't have to worry about managing the key infrastructure. AWS can take care of that. Having said that, Customers also have a choice in providing the keys to be used for encryption. Customer master keys, also known as CMK, can also be used to encrypt EBS volumes. We'll discuss more about CMKs when we talk about KMS. It's a service which is used for key management. It's called as key management service, KMS. When we talk about that, we'll talk about CMKs. Right now, we need to remember that EBS volumes can be encrypted with AWS provided keys or customer provided keys. All right, now let's talk about EBS snapshots. So we can back up the data on EBS volumes to Amazon S3 by taking point in time snapshots. So we have our EBS volumes and let's say we want to back up the data on that volume. What we can do is we can create a snapshot out of that volume and that snapshot is going to be stored in Amazon S3. Snapshots are incremental backups, which means only the blocks on the device that have changed after your most recent snapshot are saved. Let's say I have an EBS volume for which I have taken two snapshots, snapshot 1 and snapshot 2. Snapshot 2 only contains data on the files that have changed after I took the first snapshot. That's what it means by incremental backups. Only the files that have changed since the last snapshot are stored in the most recent snapshot. This kind of an approach minimizes the time required to create the snapshot and also saves on storage cost by not duplicating data. When you create an EBS volume based on a snapshot, the new volume begins as an exact replica of the original volume that was used to create the snapshot. So we have our snapshots. These snapshots can be restored back as EBS volumes. And I'm going to show this to you in the next video. We can also share a snapshot across AWS accounts by modifying its access permissions. A snapshot is constrained to the region where it was created. After you create a snapshot of an EBS volume, you can use it to create new volumes in the same region. We can also copy snapshots across regions. Snapshots of encrypted volumes are automatically encrypted and volumes that are created from encrypted snapshots 
are automatically encrypted. Well, that was a lot of stuff in this video. A lot of important and key points for volumes and snapshots. In the next video, we'll do a lab and understand all these concepts on the AWS console. If you have any questions, please put them in the comment section and do not forget to hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. We have a lot of videos coming up. I'd like to thank you for watching and I'll catch you in the next video. Thank you.